Well, brothers and sisters, in the traditional church calendar in the, uh, the Western church, uh, we have reached uh, the season after Pentecost, which is uh, normally called Ordinary Time. Uh, and, and it's called Ordinary Time not because it's plain or boring or unimportant, but because it is it is not a season in which we are leading up to a particular uh, holy day. Uh, we are not leading up to uh, Easter or Pentecost or uh, Christmas or anything like that. Uh, but instead, we are going through the scriptures sort of as a whole in the traditional uh, calendar of the church. And so today, we are going to look particularly at Jesus' teaching in Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35, which is one of the readings for this Sunday in the church calendar, uh, sometimes called a lectionary. That's what the calendar is sometimes called. This is the reading for this Sunday, then, Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of them, of him, excuse me, for they said, he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He's possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my mother and brother, or is my brother and sister and mother. Excuse me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are a few things, as often is the case, that we need to uh, clarify before we go too far into this passage. And one of them is we need to clarify uh, the reality that of what Jesus is talking about when he talks about uh, the eternal sin, uh, whoever sins blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. We'll need to talk about that. We also need to clear clear up a, a little bit, well, sort of clear up a little bit. Uh, in the beginning of this passage, we see that Jesus has gone into a house, a crowd gathers, um, and his family hears about the situation, and they say uh, they, they're going to go take charge of him. For they said, he is out of his mind. Now, it, it's not entirely clear from this passage whether in the beginning there are some family members who decide that Jesus is out of his mind and they're going to take charge of him. And those, and whether those are different family members from Jesus' mother and brother uh, 
mother and brothers who arrive in verse 31. So we don't know whether there's two groups of family who arrive at two different times or whether uh, the, the beginning of the passage is talking about how uh, they decide to go and then in verse 31, that's when they arrive. So we don't really know that. But in a sense, it doesn't really matter. Regardless, Jesus is reframing the whole identity of family here. This passage is really ultimately about family. So when you think about if a house is divided against itself, uh, Jesus is not speaking about a literal bricks and mortar and, and so on house. He is speaking about a, a house as in a family unit, right? There, there was a, a you know, there's a classic novel called The Fall of the House of Usher, right? That's talking about the family Usher. They are the house, right? Um, the house of Zelstra, the house of de Kroon, whatever, right? That is our house, right? So what Jesus is talking about is he's talking about family. Now, in order to understand what Jesus is saying a little bit more, we need to recognize that in, in Jesus' culture, in the culture of Israel at the time, family is really where your status came from. And, and this sort of makes sense, right? Because remember that, that the whole of Israel recognizes itself to be of the house of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. They're, they're from the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then when we, when we go further down the history, we see that the, the, the houses of Israel are divided up according to the children of Jacob, right? So we have, uh, we have Benjamin and Reuben and, and Gad, and uh, we have Judah and so on. Uh, they are all descended from, um, from Jacob, and they constitute the clans, the houses, the tribes of Israel. And not only that, but then you had roles to some degree defined by who your clan was, right? The Levites were designated to be priests, right? And so you're, you can see that the whole structure of Israelite society is based on their family, or at least that is how they have come to think of themselves. But one of the things that Jesus is challenging these teachers of the law and his own family about is that they seem to have forgotten or are willingly ignoring, on purpose ignoring, the reality that really the only family that matters is the family of God. And if you are not part of the family of God, then you're a part of the family of Satan. Listen, right? We've got two groups who are, who are coming to take care of Jesus, to deal with Jesus. We've got his family who decide that he is out of his mind in, in verse 21. And then we've got teachers of the law who are sent down from Jerusalem. They, they come all the way from Jerusalem to where Jesus is teaching near Nazareth in, in Galilee, right? It, they go all the way up for us, up to uh, the northern part of Israel. They're sent there to spy on Jesus and to deal with him because they recognize he's causing trouble. And, and then they, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they say he is possessed, that Jesus is possessed by Satan, and that by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons that these are false signs. It's some sort of sham, some sort of card trick, almost. 
And, and Jesus confronts them on this. He says, that doesn't make any sense. Satan can't drive out Satan. That doesn't work, right? If he did, he would have a house divided against itself and his kingdom, his, his empire, his goals would just fall apart. But not only is Jesus saying this to point out the, the, the logical flaws in the Pharisees' arguments, but he's always also pointing deeper and saying to them, be careful. Because you claim to be in God's house, but yet you are fighting against God. You are seeking to divide God's house, God's family. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. And this ultimately is what that unforgivable sin is. Now, we, we need to be careful because the, the unforgivable sin is something that has tripped up Christians and, and other people throughout history, right? It is about, ultimately, denying God or accepting God. Now, there, there are several things at play here, and, and they, they become somewhat difficult to untangle. But the reality is, is that God, being loving Father, grants us choice, but also works in us through the Holy Spirit. And so we have the opportunity throughout our lives to not only accept what God says to receive salvation through Jesus Christ, but we also have the opportunity to explicitly reject, deny, and lie about what God has done, is doing, will do. Right? And this is what the Pharisees are doing. They are deceiving or trying to deceive by saying that they're on God's side, when in reality they are fighting against God. And so not only are they ultimately rejecting God, but they are also leading others away from God if they can. By lying to them and deceiving them, they are saying evil things about, really, the Holy Spirit denying that what the Spirit is doing is actually being done by the Spirit. This is why it says in verse 30, he said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. But notice that it's not just about how the Pharisees are trying to break apart the house of God by slandering and lying about the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus, but also Jesus' mother and brothers at this point, now we know things change later on for Jesus' mother and brothers, but at this particular moment, Jesus' family are also in this place where they are seeking to, whether they know it or not, they are seeking to pull apart God's family. Right? They say he is out of his mind. So the Pharisees say he is demon-possessed, and his family says that he is out of his mind. Both are trying to pull against what God is doing. 
Now we know, like I said, when we see Mary standing at the foot of the cross with, with John and, and um, you know, John being commissioned to take care of Mary and so on, we, we see that Mary's heart changes very much. And we also know from the story before Jesus' birth that, that Mary uh, had faith at that point too. So this may be a momentary lapse, a, a falling of, into temptation or whatever. Regardless, we know that there is grace and forgiveness for Mary. We also know, um, we believe that, that the, the writer of Jude is Jesus' brother right? Uh, and so we know at least one of his brothers comes to faith in Jesus, uh, whether this was a momentary lapse or, or whether this was uh, longer term and he repented and came back. Regardless, we know that there was forgiveness for them. And so we see that they have not committed that sin against the Holy Spirit, that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. They have just stepped close to that line, as it were. They have stepped close to that line where they are uh, they are casting doubt. They themselves, perhaps, are feeling doubt. Now, where exactly the lines are drawn for sin and, and forgiveness and so on and so forth, that is something that is beyond any one of us. The point here is that Jesus redefines family. Okay, so we got to go back. Remember the saying, uh, blood is thicker than water, right? There's that saying that, that blood, in other words, the relationships between biological family is somehow more important, thicker than even the waters of baptism. Gwyneth just finished reading a, a book about the Rwandan genocide. And, and in that book, lots of things are pulled apart and, and we are not here to judge the people of Rwanda at all. But one of the very tragic things that happened there is that Christians murdered other Christians because they felt and believed that blood was thicker than water. But Jesus says, no, no, no. That is not what family is. The only family that ever mattered for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the family of God. And the only family that should matter for the people of Israel is the family of God. And the only family that should matter for Jesus himself and for the people listening to him are not the family of the Pharisees and not their biological family and certainly not the family that would lie and deceive about the Holy Spirit. But the only family that should matter in terms of loyalty, in terms of obedience, in terms of doing what is right, is the family of God. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Brothers and sisters, we are brothers and sisters. And if our biological family seeks to pull us apart from God and seeks to deny the work of the Holy Spirit, then they are not really our brothers and sisters. If religious teachers like myself or someone else try and pull you away from the truth of God, 
then we're not really brothers or sisters either. So what does it mean? Really what it means is a twofold thing. One is be wary of those who would seek to grab your loyalty over and above the loyalty you have to God. This is one of the reasons that we as a denomination are not okay with secret societies like the Masons or whatever, because one of the things that they do, they do, they may do many good things in this world, but one of the things that they do is they demand loyalty even over and above your loyalty to God. And that cannot be. And any family member who demands loyalty over and above your loyalty to God, it cannot be. When Abraham was brought out to sacrifice Isaac, God tested his loyalty. And it could not be that Abraham's loyalty would be more important towards Ab or to Isaac than to God. So there is a warning there. Know who your family really is. But there is also a promise there. The promise of the family of God. That anyone, anyone, who comes to God and receives salvation through Jesus Christ, is adopted into the family of God and has a family that is better than any earthly family could possibly be. Not because the individual human members of it are so perfect or great, but because God himself is our Father and Jesus is our Savior and we are his children. So, brothers and sisters, remember to whom you belong. You belong to God. You are part of the best family that could ever be. Walk in that light. Amen.